So welcome to the Denim Clubhouse. <laughs> James Feinhoff is taking us for a tour of Denim City. It's a combination workshop, foundation, archive, and trade school in Amsterdam, a city with a high concentration of big name denim brands and denim wearers. We wear it to work, we wear it to school, weddings and funerals, we wear denim all the time. But denim is also one of the most resource intensive fabrics in the world. Each pair of jeans requires thousands of gallons of water and the use of polluting chemicals to produce. Clearly, if you use 7,000 liters of water per jean and you're producing about a billion a year, that's something that's going to end at some point because it's just not going to be enough water for everybody. So Feinhoff is experimenting with different ideas, like increasing the use of recycled materials. This fabric is made using 20% recycled cotton fiber. This is part of the high-tech part. This is cool. And rather than using gallons upon gallons of water to give jeans that finished look, they're trying lasers instead. Denim isn't the only industry in Amsterdam focusing more on sustainability. The entire city is in the midst of a massive shift launched last year, embracing a radical new economic theory with a catchy name, Donut Economics. This is the shift we need to make if we, humanity, are going to thrive here together this century. Kate Rayworth of Oxford University calls herself a renegade economist. She came up with the model, outlined in her 2017 book, which made waves around the world and was even commended by the Pope. What is donut economics? So donut economics, it's not about donuts, but it's about the future of humanity. We offer a donut-shaped compass for creating the 21st century that we want. What makes the theory radical is Rayworth's assertion that governments need to stop looking at GDP growth as the ultimate measure of success. We're getting very, very clear signals from the Earth system, from climate breakdown, from ecological breakdown, that the way we are pursuing growth is destroying the living systems on which we depend. Instead, she says, society should strive to operate within two concentric circles that look like a donut. She uses a diagram like this to explain. The outer ring represents Earth's ecological ceiling, limits on damage being done to the planet, including climate change, air pollution, and shrinking freshwater supplies. The inner ring represents a social foundation, minimum living standards, like having enough food, housing, work, and a political voice. The ring in between, described as humanity's sweet spot, is the donut. So let's leave nobody in the hole in the middle of the donut. Everybody into this lovely green ring. Don't we need economic growth in order for economies to survive and provide resources to their citizens? What we need are economies that enable people to have good jobs in communities where they reap some of the value that's created. So we need to reorient our economies away from the notion that growth is success to the notion that thriving that meets the needs of all people within the means of the planet, that's success. Amsterdam was the first city in the world to formally adopt this model. And they did it last April, right after the coronavirus crisis began. The historical part of, uh, of Amsterdam with the, with the canals. Deputy Mayor Marika van Dornink saw it as an opportunity. Actually, this is a time where people start thinking about what is really important in life. And maybe money making isn't the most important. It's about having enough, but not having everything. Van Dornink says Amsterdam is now full speed ahead with the donut. Part of that means becoming a so-called circular city by 2050. A circular city is a city where we don't have to waste. If something is broken, we want to have it repaired. If something can't be repaired, we want to have the materials that are, the products are made of can be reused. But we also want to cut down on the consumption as a, uh, as a whole. In short, reduce, reuse and recycle. And they want to do it in three key areas, food, consumer goods and construction. They've come up with a system called the monitor to measure their progress. Among the goals, by 2030, the city must reduce overall consumption by 20 percent and reduce food waste by 50 percent. And starting in 2022, all new urban development in Amsterdam must use sustainable materials as much as possible. For example, on Amsterdam's east side, Beach Island is being built with the donut principles in mind. The city requires construction companies to list a materials passport, so if the building is ever demolished, the building materials can be reused. 
There will be 8,000 new homes here helping address the city's housing shortage, 40% allocated for social housing, and the homes will be environmentally friendly. Yeah, I think the donut model, yeah, I embrace that totally. Yvonne Van Sark lives in another new development on the north side of Amsterdam, a floating community that embraces sustainability. So we have five entrances to the jetty and there, but they're all connected. You can just walk through the area, which is really nice. In all, 46 families live here. This is our house. This is where we live. Her house, like the others, was built elsewhere and towed to this site. Van Sark's home is super insulated with natural straw between the walls and solar panels on the roof. So we produce our own electricity and we have a smart grid that um, shares it among all the households. It's vacuum, so... They have special toilets that use much less water. And they contract with a company to share electric cars and bikes. Some of the techniques we have been piloting, we hope they will become much more spread around the city and around Holland and around the world. Yeah. But will they be enough to address the global environmental crisis that Kate Rayworth describes? It's not an even situation because you can... No, says economist and income inequality expert Branko Milanovic, one of Kate Rayworth's most outspoken critics. When it comes to real uh, policy advice, it's very, very weak and it's purely voluntary and there is really no bite in that advice. Milanovic also thinks Rayworth's ideas about limiting global economic growth are unrealistic and would lead to trade-offs the world isn't prepared for. The issue is really if we were to expose Kate's ideas that we should not have an increase in the world GDP, that means that we have either to make rich people become much poorer than they are now, or we will have to keep all the poor people at the same very low level of income for a long time. Are these ideas politically viable? Well, I think that they are not viable. And I think that she's using the word, for example, thriving, that we can be flourishing and thriving without having higher income. Yes, maybe we could, but maybe also as a fact is that many people want to have higher income in order to live better. How realistic is all of this? How do you convince the world's largest economies to get on board? Well, I would flip it around and say, how realistic is it to keep running economies that think they can grow endlessly while we are visibly, evidently destroying the life-supporting systems on which our planet depends? To help promote her ideas, Rayworth launched the Donut Economics Action Lab. She says cities including Brussels, Copenhagen, Portland, Philadelphia, and others are reaching out to her to learn how to incorporate the concept of donut economics into their long-term plans.